Well, this morning we have just sung the sermon. It's a wonderful preview. We have the opportunity this morning to look into the way the revelation was composed. Under what circumstances was it written? I would turn your attention to Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. This is our text for this morning. Hear the word of God. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet, saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum, to Thyatira and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. I'd like to be autobiographical with you a little bit this morning, if you'll indulge me. I'm 48 years old. Uh, That's middle-aged, I suppose. Maybe 48 years young, sort of in the middle there. Now, by pre-flood standards, that is infantile. You had people living into their 900s. In terms of the millennial kingdom, that is but a babe, Isaiah tells us that those who live only to 100 years in Messiah's kingdom will be considered tragic. So perhaps 48 is really young. Some would call this era of life the Middle Ages. Some would call it the Dark Ages. We ought to call it the Age of Opportunity. In fact, no matter what age you are, 13 or 83 or anything on either side of that or in between, it is your age of opportunity. If you are on the earth, you belong to God in the sense of being his creature. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you belong to him in faith and you are his ambassador. And so this is an age of opportunity. I want to tell you what my study of the book of Revelation has been doing to me. It is the awareness all over again that time is short, that this world in which we live is passing away, and that only what's done for God will last. I want to be useful. If the Lord would give me three more minutes, or three more years, or perhaps three more decades, what would usefulness to Him be like? But there are impediments to my own usefulness. And it is not my circumstances. It is not trials. Injury and illness are not an impediment to my usefulness. Satan is not the impediment. But me. My own distractedness. My own sin. My own heart, that residual depravity, what we would call the homardiological hangover of my life apart from Christ. What trips me up in the endurance race that God has set before me, my own sin which so easily entangles, and the ease with which I can be distracted by temporal things. The revelation shakes this up. You can be useful when you are holy, You can be useful when you're set apart from the world that God will destroy. It's okay to be different. You can be useful when your mind is set on things above. You can be useful when your heart is heavenward. You can be useful when your love for Jesus makes you long for his appearing. Circumstances cannot impede that usefulness, not when you're holy. Your trials cannot cripple your usefulness when you are heavenly minded. Illness and injury cannot slow down your race if the race you are running is the one our sovereign God has kindly put before you. Even Satan cannot render you useless so long as you are yielded to God in faith. For our God is God Almighty and he has set his love on us and he purposes everything for our good. And the so-called God of this world has nothing on us He cannot separate us from God's love in Christ. He cannot thwart God's good plan for his children. Consider this morning John the fisherman, turned follower of Jesus, beloved disciple, companion of Christ, eyewitness to the resurrection, John the apostle, 
And with that, several decades of special commissioning as an eyewitness of the resurrection, a human vehicle for God's word, and a foundation for the church. And consider John the elder, John the pastor, who for several decades of faithful ministry served churches in a particular region. Six decades in total of faithfulness in his life. And and John in his 90s would be exiled to a remote island removed from his friends, cut off from fellowship, forced to hard labor, persecuted for his faith. And there, he would write the revelation. Useful. We'll look this morning, by way of outline, at three elements of John's composition of the revelation. Three elements of of how this book was written. And the first is John's situation. Look again at verse 9. John records, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. It begins with, I, John. This is reminiscent of I, Daniel, upon whom the book of Revelation is utterly dependent. That phrase for Daniel occurs nine times in the span of chapter 7 to 12, that future portion of the book of Daniel. And it's as if Daniel and John, as prophet here, are in humble amazement. I can't believe what I got to see. I, John, of all people, get to tell you about what God has shown me about the future. And he says, I, John, your brother. Did you see that in the text? His business card here, he's showing you his business card, and it does not say John the Apostle, John the eyewitness, not even John the elder or pastor, but I, John, your brother. This is significant. In fact, later in John's life, he, he writes his letters, 2 John 1 and 3 John 1, both indicate uh, or give the introduction of John as elder or even a fellow elder. That's interesting. He doesn't appeal to his role as apostle. He doesn't seem to keep his apostleship on his business card. But, but later in life, as he's faithfully pastoring churches in Asia Minor, he simply refers to, him, to himself humbly as a pastor, as an elder, an, an elder along with you. And then here in the book of Revelation, even beyond that, he simply says, I am your brother. Earlier in chapter one, he has called himself a slave of Christ. This is, in one sense, the waning of the apostolic age. The tide is going out on the foundation level of the church where there were apostles and prophets receiving direct revelation from the Lord. The time of the sign miracles has gone away and and John here is the last one standing. He's not even writing here as an apostle. He's writing as the revelator, the, the seer, the one receiving by God's sovereign choice this prophetic word. All the other apostles are with the Lord at this point. The eyewitnesses are gone. The sign miracles are over. The church will grow and spread now by faith in the written word of God, by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit in successive generations, and by suffering. So John viewed himself as a slave of Christ, a brother in Christ. He is humble. And he says, I, John, your brother, and notice this, fellow partaker in the tribulation, This is not a reference to the great tribulation, the one that is coming on the whole world. This is general tribulation that the followers of God experience in every generation throughout the Christian life. It is simply the word affliction. It's a word that has as its base meaning pressure. Literally, that that when a, a large weight is placed upon something. And the idea of affliction here is that great pressure, particularly of persecution for followers of Christ. John says he is a fellow partaker of it. Uh, the, the really sweet word in the New Testament for koinonia, it's a, a tender word. We describe our fellowship together. We have things in common. Uh, we are family. And here what John says he has in common with the Christians he's writing to is suffering. A kinship, a camaraderie and suffering with Christians to whom he's writing. Christ was killed at the cross. John's own brother James was martyred. Peter and Paul were killed, likely by the Roman emperor Nero. John was now alone, removed from the fellowship of the churches that he had known and loved and pastored. 
sometimes Christians who take an interest in eschatology are branded as escapist. That is, they believe a certain system, maybe their favorite end time system because they want to escape the tribulation period that's coming to the whole world. And the truth is, Christian, there is no escape. Suffering is part and parcel with the Christian life. For God's people in every era, tribulation is true in a general sense. There is a specific worldwide conflagration that is coming. But John says he's a sharer with his readers in the tribulation and the kingdom and the perseverance. And these three words are linked, very specifically linked grammatically, to bring them very close together. They're not identical realities, but here they are brought together in a very important way. Notice the order, tribulation, then kingdom, therefore, perseverance. Do you understand? Tribulation first. A kingdom is coming, and in the meantime, you must endure. This fellowship is a fellowship in affliction. We have it together as followers of Christ. There is also a fellowship in kingdom. I'm a fellow partaker with you in the kingdom. That is, every believer has citizenship in the heavenly kingdom, Philippians 3.20. And we also labor for the kingdom, that is, we labor to see the kingdom that is coming be populated by believers. And we have a present ambassadorship, that is, we represent the king and we recruit to the kingdom. There is a fellowship in affliction, a fellowship in kingdom, and this fellowship in perseverance. Perseverance or endurance is the word that means to bear up under the pressure, to bear up under the affliction, and to keep on going to live under it. It's not a flailing to get out from under what God has ordained here. Nobody likes affliction, nobody likes suffering, nobody likes the pressure, and yet all of this is in God's design. All of us are to endure, and and, and people endure different things. You know that uh, John endured a long life on the earth, and sometimes we think, yeah, long life would be great. I don't know if John was thinking that in his 90s. Oh, to have been like Peter. Remember when Peter said, hey, what about that guy? Can I live as long as him? I don't know if that's what John was thinking on a barren rock in the middle of the sea. Some of us endure a life of suffering, of uninterrupted hardship by which God seeks to make his gospel shine through that hardship. Some live a life of nonstop opportunity, this sort of endless, thrilling enterprise for the Lord's work. And, and some people have gifting and opportunity and a, a season of life and a, a season in church history where it seems like a nonstop Indiana Jones movie of one adventure to another for the Lord. And you need endurance for those things. And others live a life of duty, the grind, the routine, all in eternal perspective. What does it mean to get up every day and do what the Lord has put before me, even if it seems boring, as a matter of worship before him, as a trophy of his grace, living out the great commission where God has placed me? All three of those things require endurance, perseverance, a bearing up under what God has provided. And all of this is in Jesus, notice verse nine. This is in Jesus. Our identity is in Christ, our union is with Christ, and this brings about a union with his sufferings. Being in Christ, however, is also the source of our strength for perseverance. The best that the world can do in afflictions is to hang on in quiet desperation, right? That's the English way. The followers of Christ, however, possess a totally different view of affliction. Not just grin and bear it and hold on. But we recognize that there is present good in afflictions. Affliction produces endurance. Endurance brings about maturity and Christ-likeness, which we long for and pray for. And so we count it joy, James 1, whenever we encounter various trials. There is present good in affliction. There is also future glory in affliction. Light and momentary affliction produces for us an eternal weight of glory. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on the unseen. 
There's an irony here in this affliction to kingdom side of things, especially at the apex of Roman power. You see, the Romans promised peace, but brought brutality. Jesus promises you afflictions for following him, and then delivers peace and kingdom and life. Eternal reward. One pastor reflecting on this reality says this as an encouragement. Press on, wearied saint, till morning breaks when God shall openly and publicly appear on behalf of all who in the meantime in weakness cling by faith to his blessed name. John says in verse nine, I was on the island of Patmos. Literally, I I came to be on the island. That is, this was God's doing. John wasn't vacationing. John wasn't looking for a place to chill. God brought him here by persecutions. And he says, I was on the island called Patmos. In other words, right here in this text, we understand it was not a well-known place. He didn't just say I was on Patmos. He says, I was on an island the one called Patmos. It wasn't a travel destination in the first century. It was something of a first century Alcatraz, a barren rock in the Aegean Sea off the coast of the Roman province of Asia Minor. And I put a map up here for you. Uh, You can see Patmos and Jerusalem, and in between there is the Mediterranean Sea. That little nook of the Mediterranean up there is the Aegean Sea. And you've got Europe and Russia to the north. Uh, You've got Africa to the south. You've got Asia there to the east. And John is removed from Jerusalem and from Israel, and he's on a little tiny island off the coast there of the Roman province of Asia Minor. The island itself was 10 miles long and 6 miles wide at its widest point, something of an arc Uh, a semicircle facing the coast. It was sparse and rocky. It was a place used for political prisoners. Amazing that John wasn't killed for his faith. God had a purpose there. But it was a place of forced labor. Historians tell us that John would have worked in the mines, in the rock quarries, with little food, scant clothing, no shelter, maybe a cave to hide in. He would sleep on the rocks, and John was 90 years old. No 401k. No pension plan, no condo. Was this John's retirement dream? This is a dramatic setting, by the way, for John to be on this island surrounded by the sea. The word sea comes up 25 times in the book of Revelation. God has clearly set him in this setting to absorb the scenes that are coming in the future. One has said John was in the center of the prophetic situation situated on this island. To the south and east was Jerusalem, to the west was Rome, to the farther east was Babylon, and to the north was the land of Magog, probably a reference to Russia. And then in front of John, as he faced the near coast, was the region of Asia Minor. You can pull up the next map here. I've circled in red for you Asia Minor. It was 60 miles from Patmos to Ephesus. This was the region in which John pastored for nearly three decades. So close and so far away. What would it be like to be removed from your friends, from your church, from fellowship with believers, from those you had poured your life into, those you cared for so deeply? And John says he was on this rock because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. In other words, not a criminal. He wasn't there for wrongdoing. John was a threat to the empire. He probably was identified as a leader. If we remove the leader, maybe the movement will die out. John suffered under persecution from the government. There was a series of Roman emperors that persecuted Christians on and off for some 250 years in the church's first portion of its history. Christians were hunted and imprisoned. Their property was confiscated. They were often unemployed, unable to buy in the marketplace. They were fed to lions for entertainment. They were killed for sport. 
And it wasn't until the Edict of Milan in 313 AD where the Emperor Constantine made it illegal to persecute Christians that Christians got sustained relief. There was a cost to following Christ in the church's early history. Persecution was the norm. You know that Nero was a particularly egregious emperor who persecuted Christians. It was likely that both Peter and Paul were martyred under Nero. He was a narcissist. He wanted Rome to be constructed after his own image, so the standing city of Rome just wasn't good enough. He burned it to the ground so that he could rebuild it after his own likeness. How would he get away with such a thing? Blame the despicables. Nobody likes the Christians. Blame them for setting the fires at Rome. And then Nero had famously used Christian martyrs as live burning torches at his garden parties. Hey, I want to have some friends over for a party. Let's get some Christians, set them on fire alive, and hoist them up on stakes for entertainment and for light in my garden. Domitian was the bad guy in John's day. Domitian was the Roman emperor who sent John to Patmos. Domitian was not a good guy. He left his own sick brother Titus for dead because he didn't want him around. He killed a friend who made a joke at his expense. He married the wives of many other men. He seduced his own niece, forced her to have an abortion, which killed her. He regularly burned his enemies alive. He was profoundly embarrassed by his own appearance. He was balding, he had warts on his face, festering sores on his head, a protruding belly, and spindly legs. And yet he demanded to be called Dominus et Deus, Lord and God. He is the first Roman emperor to set up altars all through the Roman Empire to worship him. Demanded emperor worship across the empire. He began to enforce that emperor worship with legal penalties, including capital punishment. And why were Christians the target? Well, for one, Christians were easy pickings. They were widespread all over the empire, though in small communities, but they weren't revolutionaries. There was not a threat from the Christian world that they would take up arms and usurp the Roman government and do some sort of an overthrow, like many of the Jewish revolts. The Christians were seen as sectarian. That is, they they were a sect, they were a a, a branch-off group of Judaism, and and Judaism had disavowed Christians by the end of the first century. Judaism was offended by the scandal of a crucified Messiah, they were uh, offended at the uh, blasphemy of Jesus being called God, and so they disowned the Christians. Early on in church history, the, the Christians were just Jews who happened to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Uh, They were God-fearing Gentiles who believed that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah and placed their faith in him. But increasingly, the, the Jews who had special protection under the Roman Empire, they weren't persecuted for Judaism. They said, hey, we don't want Christians around. If we de-synagogue them, if we exclude them from our fellowships, if we say, hey, these guys aren't Jews, then they're exposed and the Roman Empire will do our dirty work and kill them off. So the Christians faced the exposure as sectarians. They were also seen as seditious, that is, they were opposed to the empire and the empire's view, even though Christians, by biblical command and by their actual example, were the empire's best citizens. They would pay their taxes, they'd submit to the authorities. What wouldn't they do? Worship the emperor. And so they were treated as seditious. They have another king besides Caesar and another god besides the emperor. Rumors abounded about the Lord's table, eating flesh and drinking blood. Christians were called cannibals. Rumors abounded about the love feasts and they were called incestuous. And then Christians fundamentally were considered atheists. They were considered atheists because they denied the Roman pantheon of deities. You don't worship the emperor and you don't worship all the gods that we worship. You are therefore atheists and punishable by death. Now, early church historians tell us that when Domitian died, John was released by the next emperor, Nerva, and he returned to Ephesus in 96 AD. For early church, persecution was the norm. 
And, and this is exactly what Jesus said would happen. John 16, these things I've spoken to you so that in me you will have peace. In the world you have tribulation, same word, affliction, pressure, but take courage, I have overcome the world. Paul said in Acts 14, through many tribulations, same word, we must enter the kingdom of God. Tribulation first, kingdom second. 1 Thessalonians 1.6, Paul says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation, same word, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Again, there was a cost to following Christ. 2 Timothy 2.12 promises this, if we endure with him, remain under the affliction with Jesus, we will also reign with Christ. And 2 Timothy 3.12 promises, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so the early church suffered under Rome. In the Middle Ages, the church would suffer under papal Rome. And in the future, God's people will suffer under revived Rome. When we study the book of Daniel, we call this Rome 2.0, the revival of the Roman Empire yet to come. What does it mean when Christians and Christian communities and churches do not face hostility from the world? When they're acceptable in the world's opinion? I grant there are times where faithful churches have had a good hearing in pagan society. There have been times where the gospel has flourished in certain seasons, in certain places, so that everywhere you looked was a steeple with an expository ministry and missionary sending churches. Church on every corner, and they're all preaching the truth. Edinburgh, Scotland was like that twice over. In the Scottish revivals of the 1700s and 1800s. America, New England experienced significant biblical churches spreading across lands in the first great awakening. But that's not the norm in church history. What if there's no hostility towards the church from a world that is at enmity with God and under the blinding deception of Satan? We must ask, is the church engaged in clear, courageous proclamation of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus? And we could ask that at the church level, at the institutional level. We could ask, is the American church friendly with the world, having compromised the word of God and a testimony of Jesus so as to be liked? And we could ask that of our own church. Are there ways in which we hedge on the word of God or the testimony of Jesus in order to be liked or not persecuted? And listen, in America, we we still have a lot of freedom. But know that the day will come of an intersection of the increasing hostility that will force believers in this country to compromise or to be courageous. There will be a fork in the road for us. And we ought to ask this question at the individual level. Is my own individual life characterized by clear and courageous holding, living out, and proclaiming of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus? We might say it this way. Am I persecutable? Is there evidence in my life as the world hostile to God and under the blinding deception of Satan looks in on my life? Is there evidence that, oh, he's different? That difference is a threat. Hostility. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That doesn't mean every day. That doesn't mean go out and be a jerk and try to gin up persecution just because you're not nice. (laughs) But it does mean trust the Lord with clear, courageous living for Christ in a world that is rushing toward God's destruction. A world filled with people who need to be rescued. It's okay to be different. It's okay to be useful. And you'll be useful if you're holy, heavenly minded. John wrote at the apex of Roman power, and this revelation of Christ would have been a timely encouragement from a persecuted pastor to his fellow sufferers. 
Secondly, let's look at John's transport. Again, we're, we're looking at the conditions under which this revelation was composed. How was it written? Verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Two very pregnant phrases. Literally, he says, I came to be. Again, this was not by John's own doing. Uh, just as he came to be on Patmos, not because of a, a travel itinerary, but because he was persecuted. Here, he came to be in the Holy Spirit by God's doing. This phrase, in the Spirit here, is, is not John's human spirit, it is the Holy Spirit. And it is not the indwelling Holy Spirit, all Christians have that. It is not the filling of the Holy Spirit, uh, that is a dependent life under the governance of the Holy Spirit. But here, John means by the agency of the Holy Spirit, he was transported to the unfolding of future events. And he was not in the spirit in some mystical way as if he'd worked himself into a hyper-suggestive state or some super-sensitized spiritual frenzy. You know, just kind of sing the same song, say the same mantra over and over and over again. Maybe lock your knees so you remove oxygen to the head uh, long enough till you feel delirious and weird things start to happen. That's not what John's doing. John here is supernaturally, sovereignly transported by the agents of the Holy Spirit to future events. This was God's sovereign plan to reveal the future to John. It was not initiated by John. Also, John was not dreaming. Some prophetic revelation in your Bible came through dreams, but here John is very much awake, very cognizant. He is conscious. He has a very clear frame of mind. This is similar to the experiences of Peter and Paul and Ezekiel and others. In Acts 10.10, 10, uh, Peter uses the word ecstasy, the Greek word ecstasy, that is an ecstatic transport out of the place he was in to another place. Uh, ecstasis means to be taken out of the place you're in. And Paul similarly used the same word, Acts 22, 17. The New American Standard translates it as, Paul says he fell into a trance. The same word, ecstasy, that is he is taken out of where he is. He's not asleep. He's transported by the agency of the Spirit to another realm. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul actually uses the word rapture to describe his experience of being snatched away by the Lord to the third heavens transported by the agency of the Spirit to another place. And all of this is reminiscent of Ezekiel's experience over and over again in the book of Ezekiel. I'll give you one example from chapter 40. Ezekiel records, In the visions of God, God brought me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain, and on it to the south there was a structure like a city. So he brought me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze with a line of flax and a measuring rod in his hand, and he was standing in the gateway. So Ezekiel was by the river Chebar. He was on the banks of a river in Babylon. And God, by the agency of the Spirit, transports him to another realm, literally a future one. And Ezekiel, Ezekiel goes on there to describe the temple in the millennial kingdom. He's transported to another place and another time. This transport of John here is a transportation to a scene, a scene of a future era, a series of events yet to come. Pastor Jack MacArthur says it this way, it was as though John were lifted out of this world and stationed like a spectator amid the events and circumstances of the ages that lay before him. Second very pregnant phrase here in verse 10. I, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Literally, I was in the day belonging to the Lord. John says, by the spirit, I was in the day belonging to the Lord. A very significant question arises here. What is John referring to when our English text says the Lord's day? That's a very familiar phrase to us. In fact, throughout church history, the Lord's Day is a phrase used to describe Sundays. We talk about Lord's Day worship. Um, and the tradition probably comes from this verse, although the earliest known use of that phrase was about 100 years after John's day. The Sunday in the New Testament is consistently referred to as the first day of the week. 
It's never called the Lord's Day or the Day of the Lord. Now, I believe you can establish a pattern from the New Testament and from church history that gathering on Sunday for corporate worship is the norm, but probably not from this verse. Sunday worship is not commanded, but it is a demonstrable pattern in the New Testament. Jesus rose from the dead on what the New Testament calls the first day of the week. He appeared to the disciples on the first day of the week. Pentecost was on a Sunday, the first day of the week. That's the birth of the church and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that gets the whole thing started. That as well was on the first day of the week. In Acts 20, verse 7, we read this. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day, prolonged his message until midnight. So there the the church was gathered on the first day of the week. They heard preaching. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 gives this instruction. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save, speaking of finances, as he may prosper, so that no collections have to be made when I come. What's evident in the church at Corinth is that the church was meeting regularly on the first day of the week, and they were giving financially as they gathered together on the first day of the week. This was, I believe, an established pattern pattern of the church, and and a pattern that the church carried on throughout church history. It's in part a recognition that Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. We, We love on Easter morning to say he is risen, and everybody says he's risen indeed. We can effectively say that every week. Another reminder that the tomb was empty on a Sunday morning. It is a great pattern for us to follow. We, of course, are commanded to gather together and not to neglect that. But the timing of it on Sunday mornings is a good pattern. I do not believe, however, that is what John refers to here. If he had meant, I was on the island of Patmos on a Sunday, he probably would have used the phrase that is used throughout the New Testament for that day of the week. Instead, he uses an adjective and calls it that day belonging to the Lord. It's, it's reminiscent of the phrase, the day of the Lord. The only other place the same sort of adjective is used is in 1 Corinthians 11, describing the Lord's table. It is there called the supper belonging to the Lord. There's an interesting parallel to this phrase, uh, not the day belonging to the Lord, but the day belonging to man in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. And you could just write it down if you want. You don't have to turn there. But Paul there says, I will not be judged by man's court, But literally, the text reads, I will not be judged in the day of man. Same phrase, same wording, same description. Um, And he's talking about uh, being assessed by man, but rather, Paul would be assessed when the Lord judges. It's an interesting contrast between man's day and the Lord's day. Here you have a phrase equivalent to the day of the Lord. This is throughout the Old Testament, and and, and in Hebrew and in Greek, you don't have something like an apostrophe S, right? If I said, uh, that is John's car, we're showing possession. John apostrophe S, it's his car. In Hebrew, you would say, the car of John. In Greek, you would say, the, the car of John or the car belonging to John. And, and we describe that possessive with a apostrophe S, and so to, to come across this phrase, the Lord's day, you, you really have an equivalent of the day of the Lord, that which belongs to the Lord. It is this time period of the end times that is described throughout all of the Bible. And John here in verse 10 says, quite literally, by the Spirit, I was in the day belonging to the Lord. What's the significance of that? It simply means that like Paul transported into the heavens, or like Ezekiel transported to Jerusalem in the future, John here is transported by the agency of the Spirit into the future eschatological day of Yahweh, the day which has been promised, the the day that we've been looking forward to. It's the revelation of God. It is the day when Jesus, as Lord, is vindicated. It demonstrates the arrival of his day and the end of the days of sinful humanity. 
By the way, when we get to the end of Revelation 6, or the end of Revelation 5, before we start chapter 6, uh, we're going to take one Sunday, if the Lord allows, and uh, discuss a, a biblical uh, survey of the day of the Lord. I, I want to give you a brief introduction to it this morning, and just know that we'll devote an entire Sunday morning to this topic. Uh, on the screen, I have for you sort of a depiction of the day of the Lord with a distinction between the day of the Lord, broadly speaking, and the day of the Lord, narrowly speaking. So the broad day of the Lord incorporates everything you see on the right. Daniel's 70th week, the troubling of Jacob, the tribulation period, the great and terrible day of the Lord, the return of Messiah, Revelation 19, the millennial kingdom, final judgment, and Revelation 20. In other words, the day of the Lord includes Daniel's 70th week, the seven year period of tribulation where Israel is refined where the world is judged, where, where God pours out judgments from heaven on the earth. But the day of the Lord also includes, according to the Old Testament and New Testament, the arrival of Messiah on the earth in a single moment. And, according to the Old Testament, the day of the Lord also includes Messiah's glorious reign on the earth. So the day of the Lord, according to our Bibles, covers a span of about 1,007 years. It is a season, it is God having his day. Next slide gives us another way to think about the day of the Lord. Some passages describe the day of the Lord as a day of gloom and deep darkness and judgment, and other verses describe the day of the Lord as a day of light and life and peace and shalom, God's justice over the earth. Both of these things are true. The day of the Lord is God having his day. It is the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, having his day. He will rain down judgments from heaven. He will be gloriously revealed. He will arrive on the earth, and he will reign for a thousand years. That's the day of the Lord. We'll spend some time looking at that in a number of weeks. Here, John, by the Holy Spirit, was transported to that future event of the Lord's day. And that is exactly what we have in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter one, we see the vision of the Lord exalted and glorious. It's not the way the world looks at him now. In Revelation two and three, interestingly, you have the assessment of the churches in John's own day. And there's a biblical principle here that judgment begins with the household of God. Uh, there's something the church certainly will not escape and it is the insightful assessment of Jesus, the Lord of his church. And Jesus has things to say to seven churches in Asia Minor and to our church. In Revelation 4 and 5, you get the scene in heaven which inaugurates the day of the Lord proper. That is, Jesus, the slain lamb and the lion of Judah, takes the scroll. He is the rightful owner of the earth and its inhabitants, and he is the only one worthy to open the scroll, to break its seals, and unleash God's promised judgment during the day of the Lord. Then Revelation 6 through 18 gives us Daniel's 70th week, the tribulation period. Revelation 19 depicts what is called the great and terrible day of the Lord, the narrow day of the Lord, that is return of Messiah to the earth. The Lord arrives in person. And then Revelation 20 depicts the millennial kingdom portion of the day of the Lord. God's judgment and then his reign and then final judgment. And just as God rested on the seventh day after creation, so will Christ reign and bring Sabbath rest and peace and justice to the land and the world on his seventh day. And then Revelation 21 and 22 indicate that the Lord's day will extend to endless days. God will forever be vindicated. The new heavens and new earth will never again see the days of sinful humanity. In all of this, God will be vindicated. He will have his day. The book of Revelation is about precisely that. Thirdly, this morning, we look at John's commission. What were the circumstances under which this book was composed? <laughs> John in exile. John transported to the day of the Lord. And then John commissioned. Look at the second half of verse 10. And I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, that's interesting, a loud voice like a trumpet speaking. 
So you can imagine the projection and the clarity and the authority and the volume that comes with a trumpet blast with the articulation of words as of someone speaking. That would be an interesting combination of things to hear. This is reminiscent of Exodus 19. There on Mount Sinai, we get this report. It came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. What does this sound bring about? Startling, attention-getting, clear, loud authority. And, and what does it say? Verse 11, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. First of all, write in a book. Uh, we, we think of a book like we have books bound today. More likely, this was a scroll, a scroll made of paper smushed out from Egyptian papyrus reed and written on. These papyrus reeds were glued together in strips and then rolled up, probably something like a foot wide and they could be anywhere from 15 to 30 feet long, these scrolls. And notice that John is to write in a book and send it to the seven churches. That is, there's one book, seven churches. John is not going to parcel out the seven letters and just send that section to each church. No, every church gets the whole package of the entirety of the book of Revelation. That's important for us to understand because even though there is one book and those independent churches are seven individual churches, they don't get separate letters, they get the applications to all of them. The application to all the churches is exactly what Jesus communicates to the seven. And he says there, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So again, the application of all the letters and of the entirety of the book will not just be for Ephesus but also for the believers at Smyrna and Philadelphia and Laodicea. And additionally to that, all who would hear what the Spirit says, let him hear. That brings immediate import to application to our own lives and to our church in our day. And the voice says, write down what you see. In other words, the whole book of Revelation. And then he says, send it to the seven churches. A final map here this morning. And you can see the seven churches up there. Patmos uh, is where John is. That's the island off the coast. Uh, this again is Asia Minor. This is modern day Turkey. Uh, these cities are there. You can uh, take a tour and see some of the old ruins of the cities where these churches were. Ephesus and Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. If you were to... Get onto the land at Miletus. That's the closest city to Patmos. The road would immediately take you to Ephesus and then to Smyrna and then to Pergamum and then to Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. They're organized in a circle. And, and the order in which the letters appear in the book follow that clockwise fashion of going from city to city to city. These cities were linked by a circular road. This, in the first century, was the postal route for those who would bring messages through Asia Minor. And each of these cities was significant as something of a distribution center for the regions around it. So the, the, the mail, or uh, really important government articles, or in this case, this letter from Jesus to these churches through the Apostle John, would follow this circular postal route. They would go from one to the next, to the next, to the next. And we'll look at those churches in detail when we get through those letters. But you need to understand the, the order of these events is not some depiction of successive ages of church history in some symbolic manner. No, these were seven literal churches in literal cities in Asia Minor in the first century arranged according to the road that was built there, according to the postal route. These were churches that John knew. These were churches that John had been pastor among, and these were people that John loved. Can you imagine being a member of one of the churches in Asia Minor and a beloved pastor hauled off? 
Where's John? Is he alive? Is he okay? What's going to happen to us? And can you imagine getting this letter back? And historians have made, I think, a correct assumption that Ephesus, the people there, would have made a copy to keep and sent the, sent the letter on. And the next church would make a copy and send it on. What incredible truths are in this letter, in this book? To receive this report, take courage, little Christians. Jesus knows. Jesus is in your midst. Jesus rules and he reigns. He is and has always been in charge. And Jesus is coming back. And Jesus wins. And you will reign with him. That's timely encouragement. Encouragement to abide up under affliction. It's encouragement to be holy rather than bland, blending in. It's encouragement to suffer well and be heavenly minded. It's an encouragement to be evangelistic, to be ambassadors and represent the king who is coming. It's an encouragement that time is short. The time is near. Jesus said, behold, I am coming quickly. And the whole book ends with John saying, amen. Yes, Lord, come quickly. Let's pray. Lord God, you are sovereign and in control of all history. And your beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ, will reign on the earth. And all who have loved his appearing will reign with him. Oh, how we long for that day. We long for the day when you will subdue every enemy. And Lord, how we long for the day when you will subdue your enemies that still reside in the corners and crevices of our own hearts. In the meantime, oh God, give us courage. Would you use this study of the book of Revelation to grant us courageous, clear representation of your truth and the testimony of your son. And we pray to be faithful to the end. Your kingdom come. Amen.